What's up, everybody? I'm Zach Vitovich. And I'm Charlie Bertwistle. And it's The Building Code. We're back. We are back. It's you got the hat on today? I got the hat on. So fun. Uh, yeah, I'll t- I already started. I'll share it. Um, a lot of times what's required of us, which they don't require much of us, but required show of up. us is to show up wearing Builder Trend gear. Swagged out. And I did not do that today. And I learned that John, our producer, has a drawer of Builder Trend stuff that he keeps here just for me. Because this is like fifth or sixth time I've forgotten stuff. So a this Charlie is, do, a drawer? Yeah. Dude, this is big time. Yeah. So if you're not watching on YouTube right now, uh, you can switch over there and you can see my beautiful building code hat, uh, which I have one of. I have a polo. I have all sorts of stuff. I just didn't wear it today. So, you can also buy merch on the store. You can. Absolutely. But enough about us. As always, today we have a couple fantastic guests, uh, Dan Green and Matt Simpson out at Amazing Outdoor Co. Uh, from Virginia. And... They are a pool, outdoor living space, patio furniture, everything that you could ever want. I'm doing a disservice trying to describe what they do because I was looking at their website before we came on here and I was blown away. I would pay an infinite amount of money to live in any of these houses that have these backyards. So instead of me trying to describe it, let's go ahead and get them in here and we'll let them tell you for themselves. Matt, Dan, welcome to The Building Code. We're so excited to have you here today. A little two-for-one special. It's going to be a good conversation. How are you? Great. Thanks for having us. Good. How are you doing? I always like to ask, and we kind of got a little hint, first time on a on a podcast or industry veterans here? I'd say a little bit of both. A little bit yeah, of I think both. that's our first time on, uh, on this specific industry podcast, so... Well, we like to make it our personal mission to make sure it's your favorite industry the podcast. The best experience, yeah. That's what we really yeah. pride ourselves in. So I want that review <laughs> after at the end. Like, all right, give it to us straight. Let's see what happens. Yeah, we always, we're always we looking to grow and improve. That's right. What if, what if our guests just roasted us? I we wish were, they would. Yeah, they're just it's like, called that was... constructive criticism, Zach. <laughs> and we would, we'd learn from it and we'd grow from it. Uh, well, roasted, roasted you on the podcast or the yeah, uh, like, uh, review afterwards? Yeah, like we air it. You know, like we just like full blown, like, yeah, you asked me at the beginning of this interview if we, if this was good, I got to tell you, like, I hate, I hated it. (laughs) Let's not do that. Let's talk about you two. Uh, let's start with you, Matt. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah. So I, um, I, I grew up here in Percival, um, started a landscaping company right out of high school, actually, uh, that focused mostly on uh, lawn maintenance kind of grew that into a landscape construction company over a period of about six years uh, leading up to 2019 when I uh, met Dan actually and then we closed down my former company and uh, launched Amazing Outdoors which um, is you know what we're operating today obviously and uh, we specialize in swimming pools, uh, pool houses, uh, decks, patios, anything in the backyard, outdoor living spaces uh, we, we could take care of. So um that's kind of the high level overview i'm sure we'll kind of dig deeper as we go through that's right to make it the best podcast experience possible (laughs) that's right that's That's right right. dan how about you tell us a little bit about your background uh so my background is actually a little bit unique i have zero experience in the construction industry and uh even though we've been doing amazing outdoors for about four years now i still kind of don't know what i'm doing (laughs) Um, like matt alluded to we met because he uh built my pool uh, so my background, uh, I am actually a college professor. Uh, I teach organizational psychology at doctoral level and uh, business classes for uh, University of Maryland, Jack Walsh Management Institute, a couple other uh, colleges here on the East Coast. And I was a former customer of Matt's. And uh, I saw that the the talent that he had when it came to building pools, it's kind of like the the chef that wants to start his own restaurant, so the mechanic that wants to start his own garage, right? So I figured together, uh, he can handle the, the technical side of it. I can do uh, the business and the marketing and the background side of it, and you know, hopefully, you know, Voltron this thing into a uh, you know into a good company, which which I think it is so far. So but, first uh, you know, Voltron reference on yeah. the building code. Check that off. That can't be the first card. one. <laughs> I'm, 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 trying, no. I'm trying to date. I'm Oddly trying to enough, date see how old you guys are. We yeah. tracked the stats, and like yeah. that was the first. We had a category for Voltron references. <laughs> yeah. and we just checked the box. That's Didn't amazing. Mean, yeah. right. Also, I love the organizational psychology and landscaping. That's peanut butter and jelly. I mean that. That lines yeah. up. That's I was right. gonna say. Combo. I, yeah. I think we're on. A, we're, we're starting something new here. That's, that's gonna be the formula <laughs> going forward. So. Well, it's gonna be a fun podcast, and Zach and I always learn uh, a ton. Like with this, is the <clears> best <throat> job in the world. We just get to ask questions that we're curious about. Noted construction pros as well. Obviously, yeah. you're actually in very good company. We don't have construction background either. But. Yeah. Uh, so good, this mate. will be a good one. Um, so tell us a little bit more about the company specifically. You said. 
2019 was when you met or when you founded the company? Yeah, so uh, Matt's former company was called Amazing Earth, and he'd been doing that for a uh, better part of a decade, mainly focusing on landscapes and landscape design. Uh, Amazing Outdoors was formed to be that holistic offering to customers here in the Washington, D.C. area. So things such as expanding the service model past landscape architecture and design to swimming pools, patios, pavilions, outdoor living spaces. If you're familiar with our area, you know, people around here can be, um, let's say, demanding with uh, their backyard spaces. So we wanted to be a one-stop shop that offered all of those things. Uh, the reason is, is because when I was looking for my backyard, I found it very frustrating to have to almost kind of be a general contractor myself. I had to find a pool guy. I had to find a, a guy to do the masonry, the outdoor kitchens, things like that. So when we formed this, we wanted to be that one-stop shop to serve as a, a highly custom uh, design build firm uh, here in the D.C. area. That sounds awesome. How many clients are you guys taking on on a yearly basis? Too many. Too many yeah. right now. Yeah, the, we, the pool. Uh, we're coming booming. off the rush from yeah. COVID when the outdoor living yeah. market, you know, just kind of went crazy. And uh, yeah, we're we're still you know finishing up a lot of those projects, but ideally it would be somewhere around twenty tops. Twenty a year. Yeah. 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 And those those projects range anywhere from. 300 to almost a million dollars, 300,000 to a million dollars. So, yeah. So maybe talk us through, you'd mentioned kind of the, the COVID rush and outdoor living space being kind of a new company or at least a new partnership between you two. And then kind of instantly being thrown into that. Talk us through that experience. I know the, the demand was just crazy at the time. How did you go about, you know, choosing your projects and, and ensuring it was able to be done and scalable and, and maybe just walk us through the that frenzy as i'm sure it was i'm just gonna call you guys business down. geniuses you saw it coming you're like <laughs> yeah. you know what we gotta get this outdoor living thing because we've got yeah. a pandemic next year <laughs> yeah. we uh, actually thought it was gonna be the opposite when really? the pandemic hit <clears throat> yeah yeah we actually when the when the pandemic first hit we had uh, i remember quite a few customers who had actually said um that had paused the conversation and with us when they said you know we don't know what's going to happen with this whole pandemic thing so at, at first we saw a huge dip yeah right it wasn't uh, long though the, it wasn't long though right uh, i think then once people started to realize like hey i'm going to be stuck in my house for who knows how long that's when we saw the explosion um i think with that explosion came a little bit of challenge a little bit of growing pains we certainly have stretch marks from growing as fast as we did um but i think the, the way that we were able to successfully navigate through this is is to really show that we were a trustworthy company so um our marketing and now we're kind of pivoting towards marketing strategy but here's where it's relevant our marketing strategy was to make sure that we came across as a very trustworthy company we're from here our, our, our we raise our kids here uh, they go to school here because one thing we saw that happened during covid is all of these fly by night pool companies popped up right so what became the selling i think differentiator for us the differentiator for us was being able to show that uh, you know we weren't a fly by night company, even though we were just formed a year before, right? So we had a little bit of that challenge, uh, but I think we got through it, and I think that's what um, that helped us grow, probably faster than we would have liked, but had got us to the point to where we are today. This is the fun part. This is when we can decide if we, what direction do we stay to the script or do we <laughs> jump off? Okay, always jump off. I always jump off. Sorry, Chelsea, again. <laughs> <laughs> so. That's really interesting. There's a lot of cool stuff I want to pull on there. Um, let's talk about some of those growing pains a little bit. Let's make you relive your awkward teenage years. So what were yeah. those pain points? Were you having to hire more people? Was it, was it, you know, like a labor issue and you just couldn't keep up with the bandwidth? I kind of have this vision of like that stereotypical scene from like, like a, like a movie where like they make the discovery and they, they like weren't sure it's going to work. And all of a sudden he starts like getting phone calls and like now they're rich. Like is what, what was your plate? Like, do you know what I'm talking about? Like, just, yeah. 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 Um, I, what I mean, was it like? I think we, um, I, I would say one of the worst growing pains was definitely having to scale our team really quickly and not really allowing ourselves enough time to vet those individuals out to make sure they were the right fit for our team. Um, the demand was so, heavy and the, the phone calls, as you just alluded to, were, mm -hmm. were coming in nonstop. So we added salesmen, uh, you know, service folks, uh, marketing people internally that at the end of the day were staff that we really didn't have enough time to check them out to make sure everything was legit. So I think that was probably one of the worst and most expensive, ex expensive mistakes we made. Um, what do you think, Dan? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Like you said, the, there was a rush for talent, right? Um, 
to give you an example, I grew up in, or I, I grew up in the DC area, but I lived in Austin, Texas for about 10 years. And what you find there, I don't know if you're familiar, this could be there too, is you'll see these neighborhoods that are half built, right? Because what happens is all the trades in the neighborhood, they get offered 50 cents more an hour to go work somewhere else and everybody just gets up and leaves, right? So you kind of had a similar labor rush here in, in the area where people, we didn't have time to check them out and they're demanding high salaries and we just bring them on because we have all this work. Um, so that was, uh, you know, I would say probably a little bit more vetting for, for people, but then there's a the technology side of it, right? Where here, here's where builder trend comes in is, you know, this idea that, you know, we were able to grow, we didn't have a very strong CRM at the time. It wasn't very robust and it didn't have the ability to kind of grow with us and manage our customer relationship. So we were doing things on Excel sheets, napkins. I'm sure you guys have heard all this crap before, right? Yeah, to where yeah. like, you know, we're sending out emails, we're dating emails, we're doing online Google sheets and it just, it just didn't work. So um, we actually found that a lot of our technology that we had and a lot of our talent uh, actually slowed down our growth, which may have been a good thing, um, but it definitely um, made us focus a lot more internally, taking away attention from you know our, our highly demanding customer base. So I'd say it was the talent, the technology that yeah. really hurt us during the growth period. I, I that talk, was, that oh, was the ahead. case on like the internal team, but we also struggled with you know, field help as well, mm, right. anywhere from carpenters to electricians to plumbers to anything. I mean, any of the trades being a full service outdoor living contractor, you kind of pull from each of those trades. And once people realized like May of 2020, I guess, that they were going to be stuck at home for the foreseeable future, all of those home projects began. And so every trade and every subcontractor was, right. you know, booked out for months. And that wasn't something we were used to. So when we sold a lot of our work, we promised uh, faster delivery times than, you know, based off of availability pre-COVID and then found out that that really wasn't the case. So that was a big battle we fought, you know, until pretty much now. Yeah. And I, I was looking at your uh, your website right before this. I saw you guys just got a nice uh, best place to work award, which is awesome. So clearly yeah. you, you grew through some of those pain, pains pretty well and, and have landed in a good spot. What is kind of the current team structure um, and how much you kind of have in-house versus how much are you working with the subcontractors and trades? You want me to um, I can take that one? Yeah. Yeah, so um, I'm, I kind of lead operations and sales. I, I do a little bit of both. Uh, Dan, like you mentioned, does a lot of the back-end stuff, the marketing, the business side of things. And then uh, we have two project managers on staff. Um, one field operations guy and then about 12 to 15 field staff that are um, on payroll the rest of our all, rest of our stuff is subcontracted out gotcha um, whether that be the gunite the steel the plumbing um, carpentry those those trades are all subcontracted so our structure hasn't really changed our numbers on the internal side of things have dropped because we just realized we don't really need that bloat that we thought we needed, you know, when that demand was at all time high. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I had a thought too around, you, know, you talk about like spreadsheets and using tools. The idea is like you have this hyper growth, but I call it the friction can have this effect that if you're not like putting the WD 40 in the right places, like it's even more painful, you know, you you get like, razor burn essentially uh, a lot of analogies in here yeah to, you're going you know, to make it great. happen we can go car <laughs> analogies go movie quotes even all of in a lot of ways that's what i do at builder trend like i'm i'm kind of in the back end i help reduce friction so that we can grow too so i i, I it's really hard to like get it right it's really easy then to fall into your habits too it's like when something isn't working it's like what can i do that's super fast easy but doesn't mean it's right you know it doesn't set you up for long-term success so it, it seems like you've recognized like you need those processes in order to can maintain this velocity, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely hard to, to implement those processes though. when you're going 150 miles yeah. an hour. Yeah. We've found. And so, but we're getting there slowly. Where, what slowly. have you learned? Yeah. Where are you at now in that process? Um, I think we, I, you know, I, we are not, well, according to our build a trend account manager, I think Nick, I think we use build a trend very well. Um, uh, there's some features that we don't use. Yeah. Uh, that, Sounds like you, you know, did a little account review using, recently. What's that? You did a little account <laughs> review net recently, saw some of our data yeah, in the yeah. background. Yeah, yeah. So we saw we had an account review last month. Uh, I think we use a good amount of the of, of the features. Um, I think we've finally gotten the tool to the point to where, okay, we, 
we can, uh, this, you know, certain things work better outside of the tool. Certain, most things work better inside of the tool. I think a lot of it too was on the internal adoption with our team, mm -hmm. right? So you have to remember within this particular industry, you're dealing with, even though they work internally for us, you're still dealing with guys that were former plumbers and former carpenters and, and things like that. So, you know, our challenge was, and we previewed a whole bunch of different tools before we settled on builder trend. Um, as you know, there's a lot out there. Uh, the reason we we settled on Builder Trend was was one we liked the support right we liked the idea when uh, Shelby came out and did a, a, a training with us and I'm sure she probably still has uh, uh, battle scars from that one um, <laughs> but it was high level enough to where it could handle technically all of the demands that we had during our sales and production process but then it was still intuitive enough to where our in house guys like the plumbers like the carpenters that are working internally for us now don't just see some massive IT system that they're never going to log into mm -hmm. right. Um, so I think that's been our big, biggest hurdle is is getting our internal guys to uh, to adopt it. And I think I'm pretty sure we're we're pretty close. We're we're, we're using it uh, pretty well, I think. Yeah. So a question I always like to ask, and this is literally like 90% of Zach's job is figuring this out. But I, I'm always curious about like what the correct order of adopting Builder Trend is. And you guys, you'd mentioned when you first alluded to it, you were trying to figure out the CRM, which I'm sure was very high priority with all the incoming leads that you had in, in the client relationship and management sides. But as you mentioned, as a comprehensive program, there's lots of different avenues you can go down and a lot of different features you can use. Um, what was kind of your order? And then two, how did you, it sounds like you both have like incredible growth mindsets of like, okay, we may not need this, but we know we will need this. So how do you kind of choose of when you want to expand usage? What do you want to tackle next? And and just kind of the the end to end customer journey. Yeah, so the um, so I think I mentioned earlier on the call that I'm a, a college professor. One of the classes I teach is change management, specifically with adopting new technology. So relevant to what we're talking about, right? <laughs> oh my god! Um, okay. Well, if you ever need a job, you, at you, you probably <laughs> heard or talked to former guests. There's something called the WIFM, right? It's an acronym that stands, that stands what's in it for me, mm -hmm. right? But I think the danger with a lot of big software implementations is the individual end user will say, okay, I understand this is great, it has all these features, but what's actually in it for me, right? So one of the things, one of the biggest issues we had, the first thing we tackled, and this this makes us sound very bratty when we say this, but we just had so many leads, uh -huh. we couldn't keep up with them. Leads are coming out of everywhere, yeah, right? And we're just, and we can't even call people back, right? So the whiff them, what's in it for us, right? So right away, we wanted something that was a really good lead, man lead management system. The first thing we previewed when we looked at all the different systems is, is, is how it managed the leads. I really liked how Builder Trend did the whole left side of the house thing. Lead opportunities come in, you can tag them, assign everything. So what we did is we, we identified our pain points, which for us was being able to capture and qualify all of the leads. And then we just started with that first. We actually only did left side of the house for, for probably a few months, right? I think it's probably yeah. a couple months first, right? So the way that we rolled it out, whether it was a traditional rollout or not, was we focused on the the reasons why we specifically were looking for a new because we had another system which i won't name uh that just wasn't cutting it avoiding um, cease and desist letters so that's good we'll talk about it once we <laughs> stop recording um so we we just focused on the the quick challenges it would solve for us which at the time were you know we got leads coming out of everywhere so we have to find a way to capture them yeah i will say in our uh, like adoption process we were a little late um I think we had Shelby come out like the first of March, maybe. Yeah, I think it was in and March. And our busy season starts like March fifteenth. And so it was like it was just it was it was just late. We went to IVS uh and you guys were I guess which was in like the middle of February and you mm -hmm. guys were coming out like two weeks later. So yeah, it was definitely early March and it was way too late. So when we got into that heavy selling season, um we were able to understand the leads, but writing proposals was a killer like it was because i do a lot of that and we had another another guy that did it as well and the turnaround time was just taking too long and and so that i will say for someone that has a very seasonal business like very, definitely time that that was that was definitely a big dagger for us i think yeah it was like trying to build a plane as we uh, as we fly it yeah thing. yeah wow great analogy much better than whatever zach said like five minutes ago I know I got I got to beat Zach's analogy. So I'm, I'm pulling deep here. <laughs> we need to talk to yeah. Shelby. Is this hurting or helping the review? <laughs> <laughs> we need to talk to well, Shelby. Shelby like reports to me now. Front row seat. Yeah, so I'm. I'll. You know what? I'll get your review. And let you know what she says. <laughs> right, depending on how the outcomes of this meeting goes. No, uh, Shelby. She's still doing the on-site stuff. So she just moved out of it. So she actually gotcha. is on our customer enablement team, which is like group webinars, kind of eating boards a little towards community is kind of what we're working towards. So she does BTU and helps facilitate that our webinars. She's, we got some other cool things planned 
for that team as well. But yeah, she's she's great. Cool. Cool. Glad yeah, to hear you had a great, great experience. Yeah, how long were yeah. you guys using Builder Show before you did an on site? Oh gosh, I think we signed up in November. November. I say November. Yeah, and then we kind of like we're like, what is this beast? And and then we kind of realized there was more options out there of how to like get this thing implemented. And that's when Dan and I were like, yeah, we need some yeah on site help. We we did all of the you know I I went through I signed everyone training. Okay, you do the sales path, you do the project management path, and you know I think everyone did it. And they're like, I still don't really know, you know, because it's again, it's how do you carve out time in a you know 10, 12 hour work day. <laughs> where you got to be on customer site at 7 a.m. You know, some of our guys are project management, you know, laying stone, all kinds of whatever they have to do during the day. Yeah. And then come down, switch modes and do training for an hour. Right. So I think it was, it was tough in the beginning. That's why we had to have Shelby come out and say, okay, lock the doors, don't schedule anything. Let's just focus on this. And then we were able to, you know, get it, get it going pretty good after that. But before that, I think it was a, uh, it was a little slow, a little slow. And we, we hear also, that when, you, when you talk about building the plane as you fly it, like, we had Shelby come out the first part of March. We had just hired, I don't know what, three or four new staff members January one. And so the we're lion's like, dead. onboarding this new CRM. We're teaching employees that we're not even from the industry what we actually do. Brand new office. Brand new office. Yeah. It was just it was a lot at once. Yeah. And you know, we're we're, we're masochists. We like we like to inflict maximum pain on ourselves. So <laughs> is that the psychology yeah. in you? you like, yeah, I know yeah. how much they can tolerate. Yeah. They're <laughs> not even close to their himself, breaking I, point. I not, but. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, now I want to know, like, what's next? So it sounds like you guys went through hell and back. You came out on the other side. Um, we're better for it. Have implemented a solution. Have processes in place. One best place to work. What's kind of next goal for you guys other than do less jobs, which uh, is like the best problem in the world to have? I think that's really it. I mean, just slow down and focus on the customer experience more than anything. Cause I think Dan and I will both admit that a lot of our customers were probably not given the experience they deserve during the, the rush and all of this growth that we went through. So I think our goal for 2024 is slow down, focus on, you know, delivering projects on time, um, you know, sticking to our schedule, actually being able to share a good schedule. That's one of the areas of builder trend that we're not using as nearly as good as, as, as much as we should. Um, I think that would be my stance and we're looking to kind of add some offerings too uh that are a little more streamlined and not as custom mm. um especially with you know the headwinds in the economy we're, we're looking at doing some stuff that's a little more affordable still get you that backyard experience with a swimming pool patio all that stuff but a lot faster and a lot cheaper so that's kind of where we're headed in my opinion dan can build on that yeah, I mean, like obviously being in the psychology space, my my focus has always been on that customer journey, right? And if you were to map it, it'd look like a nice U, right? They're very happy in the beginning. They're very happy in the end because they have their product, but in between they have this dip in satisfaction. They hate you. You're missing deadlines. You're, you're doing all this, you know, all this stuff. And in our particular area, we've actually found that customers, they don't really care too much when you miss deadlines because they understand the work is sequential. Uh, there's weather delays, things like that. They just want to be communicated with, right? Back in my uh, older uh, couples counseling days, I used to say communication is lubrication, right? So you can use that. <laughs> you can use that line. Um, and so one of the things that we're going to try to do that might get me an HR violation to <laughs> make sure that we use the customer portal uh, on Builder mm -hmm. Trend and really communicate with them, have it all documented in one place. You know, because right now our PM is getting texts, he's getting emails. I have to go and find and say hey, what's going on. You know, we have to find the status, right? So I think doing a little bit less, focusing on the customer journey. And really using um, the the customer portal side of Builder Trend to to make that a better experience for them for you know because sometimes we can be in someone's yard backyard for you know almost a year if they have a, a million dollar job right so uh, communicating along the way is is, is probably going to be my focus or our focus for yeah, um, for the next year yeah I, it just I, makes everybody's life easier yeah absolutely oh. and it's so funny Zach and I looked at each other when you said that Zach how many times would you say you said the words customer journey just today. <clears throat> Doesn't. I mean, yeah, it's all. It's all I think about. All I think I about. I just dream it. about it. Yeah, oh, I, thought, I thought you were gonna say how many times have you looked at each other and said lubrication. <laughs> yeah, that's. I think we're at one today. <laughs> but today's been a slow day. You, you hit the Voltron checklist and then lubrication. That was also one on the bingo sheet. That's really amazing <laughs> that you, nice, you were able good. to do that. But the the you experience that you're describing is exactly mm -hmm. the experience that Builder Trend has with their customers. Right, sales sells you the dream of like, look how 
pretty and perfect and everything this is. Just and had a room of builders like yell at me about that. So <laughs> like they said it would take a day to set it up. I'm like, I are no salespeople in this room. I was not that person, right? And yeah. then Zach's team gets you onboarded and it works perfectly to where you guys are at and they're really happy with it too. But there's a lot of uh a lot of stress and, and uh, a lot of hard work and a lot of communication of actually implementing a software. So the customer journey uh, kind of mindset that you're discussing there is applicable in almost every industry. We call it yeah, customer so success. To give you a yeah. little bit of a knowledge bomb, it was uh, Dr. Kuber Ross in 1969 came up with that and it's called the Valley of Despair. Ooh. So just in case you ever wanted to call I'm it by its official down. psychology name, it's called the Valley That's, of Despair, yeah. the Kuber Ross change curve other known as Akratovich's life yeah <laughs> yeah you didn't know you were getting a psychologist today yeah, see, despair you, you, you indeed this one. well actually i was gonna that was where i was gonna ask it is like you that. obviously got this perspective from the psychology space we have actually quite a few phd psychologies on build different staff funny enough um oh nice yeah for our talent evaluation we also have people on the we call it the insights team that has like validating educational programs. So we've used a lot of those, those social sciences. I actually have a political science master's degree. So I'm into social science quite a bit, um, to validate research methods and, you know, having like doing it the right way. I wanted to ask like, how are you bringing that to your business? Like it's one of my favorite things about construction, by the way, I've talked about this on the pod quite a bit, the patchwork of backgrounds that join construction is never ending. So it doesn't surprise me that, an, a psychologist would find his way into construction because they're just even crazier ones that I've heard. So like, how do you infuse that into your business? Well, I think a lot of it, you know, you mentioned earlier, we won, uh, you know, Inc. Magazine's 2022 best places to work. Um, so uh, oddly enough, my, my job when I was in corporate America, I worked at a Fortune 500 company for about 10 years. My role as an executive there was to work in talent management and selection and building high performing teams, right? So this came to talent selection. Uh, I love to do personality assessments, you know, assess emotional intelligence, derailers, things like that to really understand, you know, is, could this person be a fit? It's all about organizational mm -hmm. fit. Right. I think when Matt had talked earlier, one of our challenges of why maybe uh, we started hiring too fast, we didn't really have time for that selection process to, uh, to, to really do that. But um, what I try to do on the internal side is just find people that fit the culture. You can learn new stuff. You can learn, build a trend. You can learn what a joist is and all that fun stuff. But if you're not a fit, it's probably not going to work here. So we do a lot on the internal side to make sure that they're a fit. And then on the external side, we actually start, we've started qualifying our customers too. So again, this makes us sound uh, somewhat selective, but I think we are. We've gotten to the point now where I think during COVID, we would just take anybody that wanted, we were new, we'd take anybody that wanted uh, to give us money, right? But we almost interview them a little bit now. We want to see how are they going to behave when they change, when money changes hands. Are they, you know, we want to make sure we keep that relationship intact. So um, we do a lot of uh, kind of psychological assessment too. We have, we have a whole sheet of, of questions we can ask them. It's almost like a structured interview to say, how, how is this particular customer going to be? And we'll also do that to, to um, put them in project orders to, as well. So we kind of save our, you know, pain in the ass customers for, you know, different times when it's slow and, you know, that type of thing. So um, we're using it for customer selection as well. That's, a, that's incredible. Um, what, what personality assessment is the most legitimate that you think we should take? Is it like Myers-Briggs, the Enneagram, they all suck. Like, do I need to... You know, contract you, you to run in psychoanalysis. You, you, you want you want the super nerdy answer? Or yes. You want the big one? Give yeah. me the real thing. All right. So Myers Briggs is trash. Yeah, uh, I knew that. Was, I knew, I knew uh, that. I've always heard yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> Anything that is a type based personality assessment, which Myers Briggs is, it puts you into a certain type. Either you're an extrovert or you're an introvert, right? <coughs> uh, it doesn't talk about the different spectrums. You want something that's trait based, like talks about the big five, openness, neuroticism, agreeableness, things like that. The best personality assessment that you can do is something by Hogan Assessments called the MVPI. It's the Motives, Values, Preferences, Inventory. And what that does is that helps me. So if I was to give you the MVPI, that tells me what you value. Do you value being recognized? Do you value uh, working somewhere that's fun. Do you care about money? Do you care about working on beautiful things? Do you care about tradition, job security? So basically what motivates you, right? So what we do is we give the MVPI to, or what you, what you can do a builder trend is you can give the MVPI to incoming people uh, that are working there and you can frame their 30, 60, 90 day plan to say, okay, uh, you know, Matt's going to need a little bit more love in this particular area where Dan may need a little bit more here to really feel like they fit here, right? Especially with younger talent. We see with younger millennial talent and, and even younger than that that are coming out of college, they don't stay places very long. They, they, they stay for less than 18 months. So how do we get them to stay? How do we get people to stay here? 
It's really about understanding fit. So the actual term is a clinical level B psychometric assessment. That's what you oh. want in Myers Briggs's track. Hashtag. Yep. <laughs> I'm hyped. So, there's right your now. nerdy answer. Yeah. Yeah. That was sweet. Yeah. That uh, was amazing. Zach has a big grin on his face. I, did, I legit am like absolutely grinning ear ear right now. Um, how does your teams receive all that? Like, I know you, you probably don't give them all that, but like, what do they think? I really want to know. Uh, right. It hasn't worked out. <laughs> they, they think I'm crazy a lot, but you know, I, I love it. Love yeah. It. Crazy could be good. So. That was so funny. Matt's we're, face uh, we're, right we're, there. Just... We're slowly trying to get everybody on board to let me, you know, uh, if you're familiar with comics, you know, my, my favorite comic is Mr. Sinister, my license way. I like to tinker with people's minds and, and kind of play around with, with, you know, makeups and, you know, you know, the way things are set up, but they don't let me do that yet, but we're getting there. That's so funny. Yeah. Matt's face right there is just shaking. So that hasn't worked out. <laughs> it's, uh, that's we have, have yeah. You want to touch on like when we, ha- when we brought Kathy in and like how the team received that and probably. Yeah. So too, like, so, um, you know, we're, you know, one of the, one of the things that we, that really helped enable us to be, um, a great place to work was to offer benefits that no one else in the industry offered at the time. Uh, and one of those things was performance and executive coaching. Uh, so what we did is uh, we got an executive coach. Uh, we don't, well, I guess we don't call them executive coach. We've got a performance coach for everybody. And we made sure that everybody during our time of growth, and this was part of build, when we were rolling out Builder Trend as well, uh, made sure that they had a you know, performance coach. Have you ever watched that show Billions? No, I've, seen, I've heard of it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, really, it's, it's actually a super good show. But, but they have... Uh, um, they, they use performance coaches for like these high profile, like stock traders and stuff like that. It's kind of like, uh, uh, Wolf of Wall Street. Uh, but they do, but they focus a lot. It's, they focus a lot on like the performance side of it. So, uh, we hired performance coaches for everybody kind of aligned on that psychological side. Uh, and that did well to kind of alleviate the stress, the, 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 the high pressure and pace of opening a new office, hyper growth, yeah. learning a new technology, right? Um, some people were learning new industry, like Matt had mentioned, you know, we, one of the guys we hired was a, a great salesperson in the car industry. So we said, Hey, you're really great at selling cars. Maybe you're really great at selling patios. Right. So we had some people that were, um, you know, trying to learn, uh, you know, working in a new industry as well. So we had performance coaches for everybody to make sure that they, um, didn't have as much anxiety as they probably could have. Yeah. I love that. I feel like a lot of the stuff that you guys are talking about, Zach and I are writing down, we're like, all right, we're going to implement that here. It's funny. I take yeah. I take notes during every episode, but I don't think I've ever had a notebook that started with just Valley of Despair. People are going to be really worried about my mental state. Yeah, uh, that, the, the downloads on the <laughs> episode. Yeah, and the way you get across the Valley of Despair is, like, this is in the research, you have to build the bridge of hope. I don't like to say that because that sounds corny as hell. I, uh, I Googled it, yeah. Russ says, the bridge of hope. I, I <laughs> Yeah, I, I Googled it here. It has climbing Mount Stupid and navigating the Valley of Despair. And then ascending the slope of enlightenment and enlightenment is what they have here. Yeah. So you'll, you'll find with building the bridge of hope is a, is a, is a funny one. Too, I so. love that. <laughs> um, well guys, we are actually quite a bit over time. You guys have been incredibly fun to talk to. So I didn't even notice, uh, that we were over. So apologies there, but thank you so much for coming Words. on. Uh, I think we got a little bit of everything. We got starting a new company, implementing builder trend, uh, despair. The journey. Uh, the, we yeah, had the, the journey. full journey with the we intro, the, the value journey. despair, and now we're happy. And five, five out of five best podcasts you've been on, right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> right. 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 Pause. The review, it's in. Long pause. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. we really do appreciate That's, the time, guys. Fun. Yeah, yeah it's it been awesome. fun. My only, my only requirement is uh, you can ask Shelby how uh, you know. Don't don't ask her how 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 crazy we were when we were here because then you know your, your opinion of us may change. No, I'm just kidding. She was great. I'm just <laughs> yeah, want to give. Awesome. I just want to give another nod to Shelby. She was she was really great. That that was. Um, I think that's one thing, you, and we can end with this if you like. Is I think one thing that you guys do really well is that too often I see organizations within software where they sell you the software, they flip the switch, and they say, "Have a nice life." Right? There's no. Uh, J.B. Woods referred to this in his 2009 book, Consumption Economics. Um, there's no real ongoing push to make sure that, hey, we've sold them the technology. How do we make sure that they're actually consuming it and then using it well, right? Um, and I think that uh, Builder Trend does a really good job of that. And when Shelby was here, she, she, did, a, she did a great job with that. So not shaking, hats off to her. It's going to yeah. make her day. Thanks for sharing that. You did a great job. Sweet. Well, thank you guys so much. And we look forward to talking again. Hey, thanks. Absolutely. Well, Mr. Burt Whistle, that was 
a lot, honestly. I'm like, I love when we have on the podcast and we get some tangible things that I was like, oh, I could be a better leader with these things. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Hopefully you listeners out there feel the same way. What do you think? Yeah, I thought it was fantastic. I think, uh, you know, he mentioned at the end there, he's like, I hope it wasn't boring. And like, no, that was an incredible interview. And that's what I love about this job and this podcast and you and our whole team and every guest that we have so much is like, no two episodes are the same. And that one was one that is applicable to everyone, not just in the construction space, not just in the pool space, not just in the technology space. Uh, But how do you manage change? How do you grow not just a company, but a team? Uh, There's a lot of applicable things. I have some awesome notes written down. Um, So yeah, I'm fired up. They were, they were great. Yeah. And we've got some big things happening. We hope that you'll come back and check it out. We'll be here. We'll be here. They swap them out every hundred or so. That'd probably be about right. As always, please make what sure heck of a run. to like, review, subscribe. Tune in next week. I'm Charlie Burtwistle. I'm Zach Watovich. We'll see you. Thanks for watching the video. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for exclusive content brought to you by Builder Trend.